What is it that makes a people a nation? Is it a common language? A common history? All people feel connected to the land where they were born. First Nations in America feel this connection very deeply. How does one react then when your people are dispossessed of their land? Your language left to perish by the wayside and your history consigned to the backwaters of time's swift flowing river. The Shoshone Nation was one of the largest in America when white settlers began to move west of the Mississippi. While they discouraged intermarriage, the Shoshone interacted freely with other peoples like the Navajo and enjoyed the benefits of trading with other cultures. The Shoshone welcomed the arrival of European peoples, much as they welcomed interacting with other First Nations peoples, allowing travelers on the Oregon Trail to pass safely through their lands. More so, perhaps, as they believed that the white people were sent to them from the Maker but soon the new arrivals proved anything but heavenly. By the time the white culture had overrun all the Shoshone territory, the nation had been split into bands, relegated to arbitrary reservation lands, and cut off from their traditions. In this video, you will, you will hear about the history of shaped lives. You will learn about the challenges that Time flows on into the 21st century. Prior to the, the white man coming, the uh, Shoshones roamed all through, uh, let's say, Montana, up into Canada, over into Wyoming, uh, down uh, through Utah and uh, Nevada and into California. The Northwestern Band uh, was, was one part of of uh, the Shoshone Nation. Now the Shoshone Nation, uh, there were uh, somewhere between, uh, if I remember right, it was like eight or nine different bands. I can't remember all, but I remember that there's the Boise, the Bruno, the Weezers, the Lemhi, uh, the Eastern, the Western, and the Northwestern. And, all, and there was the Weber, what they call the Weber Youth, but they were actually a, a, a portion of the Northwestern band. At one time, that Shoshone people, there were in the amount of 28,000 Shoshone roamed this area. They migrate with a season, like during Salmon Run, everybody goes to Salmon. People in Northwestern Bend, people used to go, they have, they have identification like Agaidika, the meat eaters. Uh, or the fish eaters, and Tivarika, the people, Western Shoshones, are Tivarika, meaning pine eaters. So you gotta understand, they, they move from, family moves wherever they want to. There was no, they were more nomad. They didn't move as a whole tribe like you see in picture shows. They moved in little family groups because it'd be very hard on the environment and ecology if they a whole three four hundred people move and try to hunt and live in one area you know how it devastate the, the game that was one of the main reasons our people the northwestern also live the uh, way of the uh, desert people by picking uh, the roots and flowers berries and bulbs and cattails and also the way of the mountain people by taking the animals of elk, deer, and the plains people by going up and uh, being involved with the bison hunt through the way of the horses. So the Northwestern is a little bit of each one of the Shoshone tribes that was once before. The Shoshone were some of the first victims of the influx of settlers. The pilgrims of the Oregon Trail, the Mormon Migration, and the Great Westward Expansion Era all came into contact with the Shoshone, and the Shoshone were most often the worst for it. Well, in about, oh, I guess the first part of the 1800s, uh, the first white men came into the valley, and uh, these were the trappers. And, uh, and they were here until probably 
uh, the 1840s and uh, when all the beaver got trapped out and they moved on. Then, but by then, uh, the Oregon uh, migration had started and uh, the Oregon Trail cut right through Shoshone land and uh, the people that were uh, moving through there, their, their stock ate up all the grasses that the Indians used for seed to make flour with and soup and mush uh, because, you know, for the winter. And their stock ate that up. They, uh, the immigrants killed all the game, you know, within, within the area. And uh, so the Indian was getting pushed out of their own home areas. That's when they started a, a kind of attacking these wagon trains, trying to get uh, or stealing stock and uh, cattle and, and killing them for food. Well, in uh, 1847, the Mormons came into the, into the valley. And then from that point on, the Northwestern Band's lifestyle is completely changed because they, uh, uh, the Mormons moved in here, they meant to stay. They weren't just passing through. And as they stayed, well, then they started farming. They started settlements. And uh, it was more permanent, fencing the land. And again, the Indians started to uh, get pushed off of their, their land, and then they retaliated. And as I said, by raiding and, uh, and stealing stock. The negative interactions between the Shoshone and the U.S. government came to a head abruptly and violently in the winter of 1863, as the Shoshone gathered quietly at Bear River to celebrate the warm dance together in hopes that the maker would give warm weather and good hunting. I realized as I go along, you know, growing up, I've, I've heard about this here Mesker site, you know, how the people got wiped out over here to uh, west of Preston, what they call Bear River, Bear River Massacre. Back then, they call it uh, Battle of Bear River, which uh, it goes on, and the old people talk about it, and then they said it wasn't, it wasn't a battle, it was a massacre. In 1863, 29th of January, their hunters and the young men went uh, hunting towards Sody Springs, Idaho. They went out there to get some buffalo, elk, and deer meat to bring back to their loved ones to have the big celebration. When they called upon the soldiers in California. White people used to call the battle, but it was no battle. It was a massacre. Indian people were at peace with the white people. And uh, they saw that they knew that the, tr the troops went by in previous times because for the Northwestern Band, that was their wintering ground, their traditional wintering ground. That's when a lot of people would gather together to spend the winter. Where they were just nothing but older men and, and kids and, and women that was there. And when Colonel Connors came, when the men were hunting uh, away from the campsite and nobody was there, just the women. And so um, that's how come they were, a lot of them were killed. Massacred them. Children, women, and old men, they cannot fight. That's really disgrace, I think. They just descended upon the Indians and massacred them, and it's sad. But uh, now it's our turn to tell our story. After that confrontation, the, uh, their survivors kind of scattered. Some went to join Pocatello uh, up around the raft, uh, or City of the Rocks. Uh, others went to uh, live with the Eastern Shoshone. And then the remainder of them went down into uh, uh, the lower Bear River around uh, Corinth. And they uh, started a little settlement there, they, they camped there, and then, then the missionaries came in and they started to convert the, uh, the Indians that were there by Korean. Painful as is the memory of the Bear River Massacre, less violent acts are just as painful to recall for the people now identified as a Northwest Band of the Shoshone. Perhaps because unlike the dead who can be honored and mourned, other crimes committed against the Shoshone are still a part of their present lives. 
especially for those who live in the Washakie area and who had interactions with the new Mormon religious culture that had come to live there. The Mormons took advantage of the status accorded them by the Shoshone and acted as if they had, indeed, come from the Maker to guide the people. Uh, when reservations were created in 1868 at Fort Bridger and, and uh, Fort Hall, Idaho, our uh, members chose not to go to either of those reservations because of our affiliation with the uh, Mormon church. The church, still wanting to help the Indians, uh, moved, uh, moved them up to uh, what is now Washkey, which is about 20 miles from Malad, figuring that, okay, this is an area up there where nobody would, you know, they wouldn't be bothering anybody. Indian religion at that time almost believed the same general idea as the white people. They believe in death. They believe there's life after death. This isn't the end. That we're all brothers and sisters, no matter what, we're all human beings. Even the animals are got spirits. The Mormons said that, uh, give me your land, your deed. I'll take care of you for the rest of your life. I'll even bury you and give you a little money as we go along. And some of the peoples must have fall into it, you know, without looking at it. Like so many other promises made to First Nations peoples, the promises made by the Mormons to the Shoshone were short of the truth and short-lived to boot. Like the Spaniards, the Mormons' vision for civilizing the Shoshone was to turn a hunter-gatherer culture into a farming community and to recreate the spiritual lives of the natives in their own image. Some of the Shoshone became acclimated to the farming life. Many more, even those whose families were most hurt by the Mormons' double dealing, embraced the LDS religion. Washkie was quite, quite, quite an organization of church and Indian group. We didn't have too much of an Indian government at all. Uh, the Mormon people taught my people there in the Northwestern Band a lot of things, how to form, how to work. They had a lot of conviction in the church. They felt very strong about it. And the government tried to intervene and wanted to set up an agency and uh, organize it, maybe make a reservation there near Washkie, you know. And the Mormon people says, well, what are you people, government's going to give you what we're not giving them, which is true. All oh, the farmland was broken in and desagebrushed by Indian people. They homesteaded it with their horses and all kinds of equipment they had at that time. Dug that Samaria Canal that goes to Washkie from Samaria, Idaho. That's, that's, that's built by Indian people. A lot of the Indians were self-sufficient that way. By that time, a lot of people left uh, the Bear River Valley because they knew that there's something there that's not good for them because it's, people are chasing them out, but the faithful stayed. People forgot to tell them you have to pay taxes. They, Indian people don't know anything about taxes. A lot of those lands were taken away because of uh, payment of taxes. And then finally, somebody woke up and says, well, well, let's put these in trust lands since you're an Indian, and you're a recognized Indian. And so the government went in and put some of those lands and put them in trust land, just like the, the Neiman land, that's a trust land. We don't pay taxes on it, it's considered a reservation. It's sort of like a Ku Klux Klan deal. The, the, whole, the whole thing was burned by white people and because of the Mormon religion conviction, they didn't want to point fingers without evidence and they just left from there. The church gave us 200 acres there because Everybody was crying. There was a lot of bad things happened. I thought Washki was our home, you know, and all that. But later when I grew up, it was different, you know. We were living on a church project land. So when they told us to move, well, everybody moved away. Once the people moved out of, out of Washki, well, the church uh, felt no need to have that farm there. So that's when they you know, burned the buildings and, and uh, or the houses and sold the land. And that uh, put the Northwestern Band in a kind of a, a position to where 
we couldn't go to the government. The government, even though the government recognizes, we we did not have any uh, history with the government. So we had to start almost from scratch, starting in, in, in back in the 40s, and that put us years behind all the other tribes. I think we had a few families up there until the mid 60s. So now we're basically located between in the communities along I-15 from Salt Lake City to Pocatello. The way I see it now, you know, church only supposed to have their land sitting on half an acre. Not all the land. The man up above didn't send the, the good peoples up here to stole all the land away from the Indians. That's the wrong thing what they have done there, you know. Why they do it is a land, is the resources, and all that stuff that goes with it. We've been stolen blind here, you know. If the Indians were greedy, you know, back in them days, they would have never entered this country. Never. We had this treatment from the heavenly believing Christian. We had a mistreatment from them. Today, the Northwest Band of the Shoshone still feel the effects of the mistreatment they received more than a century ago. Like many First Nations peoples, today they face challenges of sovereignty, lack of medical care, and perhaps most importantly, preserving their language and culture as the birthright of the next generation of the band. All my children know how to do that. They all know how to dance the Indian culture, so we're all in that now. And we love it because it just kind of, that's what they left us. We shouldn't lose it. That's what I believe in. We should keep our culture and our Indian language, you know. My grandpa and grandma would show me the roots, the berries. They showed me how to tan hides. They showed me how to um, do the fish, how to dry it out. They showed me how to just love nature and to respect it and just to give back what I took. I remember going to high school. I, in, in Utah history books, I never learned about the Northwestern Shoshone. I never learned it and I learned it from my grandpa, I learned it from my grandma. And they don't teach it in history books and I want kids and people now to know what the history is about. The tribe has gone from uh, almost obscurity, almost being wiped out, to back to a population now of about 431. Uh, we uh, have gotten away from the culture and traditions because uh, we're, we don't have a re reservation, we don't have a land base. We uh, live throughout, you know, the the white uh, community, and so therefore they marry non-Indians, and uh, with that our, our, our uh, blood quantum is decreasing, and that's one of the reasons why I want to, you know, to get back into a community. I've heard uh, one elder I knew very well, Jacob Piope, he, he says, I see no future for, for you you younger kids, you're going to be out of here. You'll, you'll never come back. He says, you might come back here to that hill with me. He said, that's that graveyard. And I think the future is great because of the upbringing or young kids. I have a lot of faith in our young kids. And uh, one thing I hope that they will never forget their heritage, where they come from, their ancestry, and their language especially. I was kind of hoping they would pick up their language. It is an old lesson, in unity is strength. By uniting as a band and as a nation, by reaching out to other First Nations peoples, and by helping us all to understand their identity and rights as a people, the Shoshone have begun to heal the old wounds inflicted on them as the white nation moved west. They have begun to tell their story and to make their heritage, traditions, and rights as a people an important topic for discussion among First Nations and those who came later to these lands. As the Northwest Band of the Shoshone moves forward to face the challenges ahead, they challenge all peoples to join in their struggle for identity, dignity, and the right to flourish as a sovereign nation. We want to 
to make sure that our members have adequate housing, that our children are protected, that uh, education, I think, is a very important component of our government. Uh, if we can educate people, they can take care of themselves. I see a future for the, the, for the young children because they got good opportunities today than we had when we were their age. And that they should see that and, and, and go for it. To regain our culture, regain our tradition, and yet live in a white dominated society. Um, and I think that it can be done. It's, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna take a lot of effort, but we can do it. I wrote to one of the senators once, state of Utah, and I says, how come we're not in the, in the history of Utah? Why do you people always write your story? And you know he wrote back, and I've got that letter, and he says, we don't do those intentionally, Eventually, we will put him in the history book. I'm still waiting. It's not in there yet. Maybe a little bit, but not the way we want to tell our story. So we're now beginning to, to tell our story. And it's about time, I think.